Hello there, Pastor Josh Shelton here at Redemption Church. I just want to take a second and say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I truly hope and pray that it is an encouragement to you. And if it is, would you please consider giving to Redemption Church? You can do that by going to our website, redemptiongillette.com. Again, I just pray that this is a blessing and an encouragement to you. Thank you for watching. I said I want to introduce myself, which is what I should have started with. Um, I, I am the, the lead pastor here. My name is Josh, um, and thank you for joining us. If you're new with us here, I just if you are new with us, we have the Connect cards on the back table there, and you can fill out that Connect card, and it's just an opportunity for us to, to, to follow up with you. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us this morning. So let's go ahead and get into it. I should have, as the whole time I was talking there, I should have been opening up my thing here, but I wasn't. That's where my brain is today, so just just buckle up. All right. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and find your Bibles, follow along on your phone. It'll be on the screen as well. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 17 this morning. We're going to go ahead and read this passage together. 1 Samuel 17, that might, that might jump out at you. If you're not familiar with that, you will might maybe notice it here in just a moment. But let's start in verse 1. We're going to read the whole thing together. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soka, Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes de Dem Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the, on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem and Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they, all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the bags, baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. 
Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption your presumptuous presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from his him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his, his mouth. And if he, he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the, the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, his disdain for him, he had disdain for him, for for he was a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Aram as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back and from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it into Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent." As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So before we dive into God's word, as we just read that whole section, it's a great story. Let's just, let's just pause just a moment and let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Father God, we thank you for this time. Lord, we do pray now that as we open up your word, God, we pray that you would open up our hearts as well, that you would prepare us now, even in this moment, to hear what you have for us today. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for the next well, it started last week, and then for the next few weeks, we're going to do this series called The Line in the Sand. And this series is, is going to be about a line drawn, a decision made, where you say, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I believe, no matter what. 
no matter what the cost is. We're going to look at four stories of faithfulness to God in the face of opposition, of persecution, and times at times really grave danger. So last week, we looked at the book of Joshua, where Joshua, at the end of his life, he reminds the people of Israel about the, the commitment to be faithful, devoted to the one true God. He gives them two options, if you recall. Remember, he says, you can choose God, or you can choose the, 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 the small g gods over here of the Amorites. Literally, he's saying, choose God or choose anything else, right? But as for him, he declares himself. The people follow suit. He says that he, along with his house, will serve the Lord. And he draws this line in the sand. And in those last few verses there that we saw, we saw these characteristics of Joshua that are going to continue to surface as we go through this series and consider this concept. Those four characteristics are faithfulness, boldness, awareness of the cost, and steadfastness. And so as we go through this series, just not today and beyond, consider this question as we, go, as we do this. Where will you draw the line in the sand? Where will you draw the line in the sand? So this morning, you probably already noticed, maybe you're familiar with it. We read a, a very well-known passage of Scripture. We talked about the David and Goliath. So let's get into that text together. To give you a little bit of context as we, as we dive into to God's Word this, this morning, David here in this moment is a young shepherd. He's already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And along with taking care of his father's sheep, he was in in the service of King Saul as his armor bearer. So as we come to this passage, we are looking at this this morning. The the scene is set with the Israelites and the Philistines drawing battle lines, right? If you can imagine this in your mind, they're they're setting up on both sides of the same valley. They can see each other. And and if you, from, from, from accounts of this, I haven't been there, but from accounts of this, you could see pretty much, you could see their entire army from the other side of the valley. So, so you would have been seeing the entire other army, but there's this deep draw in between. And we see here in this valley of Elah, which just, to, just for a frame of reference, is about, I think it's 15 miles west of Bethlehem, to kind of give you, if you're familiar at all with that territory. And this man named Goliath, this Philistine, he comes out and he challenges these Israelites from the distance, from the other side of the valley, he challenges them for 40 days. Every day for 40 days. And he would more accurately, I think, be described as a, a, a giant than just a man because he had this really imposing presence. He was said to be over nine feet tall. And we see this description, this intimidating presence. And Think about this. His armor, and maybe you've heard this before, but his armor... Uh, to us, seems unbelievably heavy. It's 5,000 shekels uh, of bronze, which I I know you're probably thinking, I have no idea how that much that is. Maybe your translation tells you it's about 125 pounds. You're like, man, that's really, really heavy. But consider the size of Goliath. Consider how big this man was. Um, It probably actually was impressively light for its size. But it's still 125 pounds. It says that his spear alone uh, his, the, the spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds. And the Philistines were, a, 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 the, just a little bit of history for you, the Philistines were a military might in their day. They were, they were well advanced in forging in bronze and iron, and so their, their, their military technology was well advanced. And so that's why we see this, this great detail in this description of the, his weapons and his armor. And his strength was assumed by his commanding presence. There was little doubt to his ability or his confidence. Nobody's looking at Goliath and saying, that, that guy, that guy can't, can't hold his own in a fight. Right? Like people see Goliath and they're just like, oh, okay, all right. That's not the guy that I want to make angry, right? They, 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 they see that from his physical appearance. And so Goliath, he comes out, it says this in verse 8, he comes out every day and he would challenge the Israelites with this, send out one man to find, fight me. One man, if they win, we'll be your servants. We'll serve you. If, if we win, though, you have to serve us. Seems like a, a pretty straightforward challenge. It's really actually known as a contest of champions, right? Goliath, in this case, would be the champion for the Philistines, and he was calling the Israelites to send out a champion. A champion, quite literally, is a man in the midst, or a middleman, a person who advances between two armies to decide a battle 
in single combat, by single combat. And so it, it, this, was, this was a, a military strategy. There's, the, the reason why is because they're tr- trying to avoid unnecessary bloodshed. And there's no need to wonder how the Israelites camp, the Israelite camp viewed this giant either. What does it say in verse 11? That they were dismayed, that they were greatly afraid, including King Saul. It doesn't say king here in my version, but that's the king of Israel. That's their leader, and it's saying that he is afraid as well. They were dismayed and distressed. That is, that they were, had this extreme fear and anxiety. It came over all of the Israelites all of them because of this one Philistine. They were running away in fear at the mere sound of Goliath's taunt. So Goliath throws this out there and they run in fear. All of the Israelites except David. David has this weird, really weird response. You know the whole like fight or flight thing? David has this really re- weird response where when everybody else is running away, he's like, no, I think I'm going to go in this direction. No, I, actually, I'm going to go this way, right? Because he knows where God wants him to go and he goes in that direction direction. He runs toward the fight. And then in verse 12, we are reintroduced to David's lineage. Even though it's already been mentioned in chapter 16, it's, it says that Jesse had eight sons. David is the youngest, and three of the, the three oldest sons of Jesse go to fight, are in this army, King Saul's army. And it, it's interesting here, uh, so David, he was the youngest, but he was the armor bearer. But, but even as the armor bearer, he wasn't always by King Saul's side. He would go back and forth to Bethlehem, taking care of his father's sheep. And so this, this standoff, it lasts for a while. It lasts for at least 40 days. And, and so Jesse, he, he sends his son to take provisions um, to his brothers and to see how they're doing, to kind of get a report of, of how the battle's going, which, I, by the way, that report would probably be really, really boring. Well, this big tall guy keeps on like taunting us and like we keep on like 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 talking ourselves up and like getting ready to go and then nobody actually goes and then and then a new day starts. Like that that report would be really, really boring. But he's looking for a report, he sends provisions with David, and so and he also requests that his son bring back a token from the battle. And that's an important note as we talk about Jesse sending out his son, because David wasn't just there by happenstance. Like David was supposed to be there. It wasn't like he was just like in the, the, the wrong place at the right time kind of deal. Like David was supposed to be there. He was, he was asked, he was sent to go there and he was meant to be there, sent by his father. And, and David obeys and it happens, he, he gets there and, and as he gets there, he leaves early in the morning and as he gets there, he happens to get there just in time to hear this insult, this slur from Goliath, Goliath saying to them across the valley, the Israelites challenging them. And he witnesses this challenge, but he also notices that the men of Israel were afraid and fleeing from this Philistine. And he overhears some soldiers talking about what King Saul has promised to the person who defeats this Philistine. He promises great riches. He promises to give his, one, his own daughter to the victor, right? Which is very customary there. Then. And, and it also says that, oh, you, you know, your, your family also won't have to pay taxes for the rest of your life, right? And so th- that seems like quite the haul for the victor. The king is trying to incentivize some brave or stupid soldier to face Goliath. But here, but there are no takers. No one is willing to give it a try. We all have that friend, by the way, just as a side note, we all have that friend that like is the first one to do the dumb thing, right? You don't? If you don't know who that is in your friend group, you probably are that friend, by the way. Um, I used to be one of those people when I was a little bit younger. I was the dumb friend that was doing the dumb things. But, but here, it's hard for me to imagine the, in the whole Israelite army, you're telling me that there was no, no, not one dumb soldier that was like, oh, guys, check this out. Like there wasn't one guy that was willing to do that. But apparently there wasn't. David asks what the reward is for the person that defeats Goliath. And notice how he words this question. Look in verse 26 with me. Verse 26, it says this, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, you might might read that and be like, man, he's just inquisitive. He just wants to know what's going on. 
you know, just a, a typical teenager. He just asks a lot of questions and trying to figure out what's going on. But what's interesting about that is the boldness of, uh, in what David is saying. David is essentially asking those soldiers, what is going to happen to the person that deals with the shame and in the embarrassment of this challenge towards Israel? This giant is making this Israelite army look like fools. And he simply and boldly asks, who is going to put a stop to it? Who's going to end this now? And notice what else. Who is this Philistine that doesn't even know, know and is refusing to obey the living God of whose armies are being challenged? Where everyone else there sees this Philistine for his imposing physical presence and is intimidated, David, this young shepherd, he sees through the facade. He sees right through that, and he is deeply offended by this challenge towards his God. Right? He's not noticing Goliath for his physical appearance or even from his, his, past, his past experience of, of battle and war. He's not looking at Goliath and saying, oh, this is an intimidating presence. He's like, how dare you? And as David continues to talk to the army about this, word gets back to King Saul and he summons him. Look what it says. Read it with me again in 32, what David says to King Saul. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, him being Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. This, 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 is, this, is, this is manageable. Don't worry. This is, this is okay. This is, this is all going to end today. And I love how matter-of-fact David is in this account. No sign of fear or anxiety in his words here. King Saul probably thought that he had misheard David in this moment. Surely he hadn't meant that he was prepared to go and fight this Philistine. I mean, David was just a boy, and this, this, this man, this giant, had been fighting since he was a boy. Surely he misheard him. But David doesn't waver. He tells King Saul of how the Lord delivered him from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. Goliath is aptly compared to a roaring lion or a charging bear. And God likewise will deliver David from the hand of this Philistine. It's interesting to hear is, is we, we can't see that David, we can't see from this that David's just shooting from the hip. That David is just like, just wal waltzes up and he's just, he just happens to be that one dumb soldier. No, that's not, that's, not, that's not what's going on here. He's not shooting from the hip. He has reason to believe God will protect him and fight for him. He has seen and experienced it himself. Similar to last week when Joshua matches the, the faithfulness God has shown him, David is confident in the Lord's protection because God has done it before. He can point back to God's track record and say, see, God will provide. See, God, God will, will protect me here. We are sometimes prone to doubt and to question God's power over our circumstances. But if we recall the moments in our lives and those around us where God has time and again revealed himself, we can be encouraged. We can be encouraged and, and, and brave in the face of unknowns and fears and trials and anxieties. Not because of who we are, not because of our, our might, our will, power, our strength, but because of his. That's what David does here. And the King Saul, he gives in and he says, all right, all right, go. Go and, and the Lord be with you. And then we come to the moment of truth in verse 38. After agreeing to David's seemingly foolish plan, King Saul charitably offers his armor to wear. You know, it's interesting in, in history here that, that actually it was believed that wearing a mighty warrior's armor, you would then share their, their, in their strength and their skill. I don't know why, but my brain keeps on going back to the movie, movie Mulan, right? And she puts on her dad's armor and like somehow she's going to be this mighty warrior because she's wearing her dad's armor, right? So there was this belief that if you put on somebody else's armor, that mighty warrior, that you were somehow going to absorb their, their strength and their skill and their ability. Some biblical scholars suggest that King Saul was trying to share in the potential glory, but I personally think that's a little too generous of Saul. I think it's a little too generous. For, for Saul to see an opportunity for glory, he would first have to have faith that David could actually beat Goliath, which I do not believe he predicted. But because David is so small, the armor doesn't even fit him. If you recall, Saul is, is taller than everybody else. Like tall, Saul's a big guy, and David here is not. And 
So he winds up the, the, not wearing his armor. It ends up just being a hindrance more than anything else. And instead, David takes his sling and five smooth stones from the stream running through the valley. And David moves forward and he approaches Goliath. And this, as you can imagine, if you, if you imagine yourself being Goliath, Goliath is in this moment, which maybe you don't want to. Goliath doesn't, doesn't his, his story doesn't end well here. But Goliath sees this boy coming towards him, and this invites great disdain from him. And to call it trash talk is probably not enough. He is very angry at this moment. He's utterly angry, angered, and offended that the Israelites would even consider this a worthy opponent to him. David was not worth his attention, let alone his respect. But as we have seen up to this point, this doesn't even, this doesn't even phase David. David, in verse 45, it speaks directly to Goliath for the first time, and he speaks with the same boldness that he had with the soldiers, and he had with King Saul previously. Look at verse 45 through 47 with me. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He says, you have all these really great weapons. Mine's better. Mine's better. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give you give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? Why is he committing to this? Why is he staking this? He says, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with the sword, not with the spear, not even with a stone. But the, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David says to Goliath, your weapons might intimidate some, but not me. I come before you with a weapon far superior. I come in the name of the Lord. This moment is so incredible to me because David is, he's aware of the absurdity of what he's saying. I believe he's aware of the absurdity of what he's saying here. David is not delusional. Look what it says at the end of verse 46 and 47. David is aware that nobody expects him to win this battle. But that means that when he does win the battle, God will receive that much more glory. He says, I will defeat, defeat you today for the simple fact that all the people here and on into the future will know that God really exists. And he's powerful to save. And this is the ultimate purpose we have as, as believers, if you, if you are a believer in Christ. This is our ultimate purpose, to make much of Christ. We're not meant to celebrate ourselves, but to get out of the way, to be as transparent as possible so that the world can see Christ through us. And notice, though he is speaking in the first person, there is no I in David's thinking here. He's not, he's not thinking, oh, my, my glory, my riches. I, he, he's not asking those questions of what's going to happen to the victor because he is greedy, or because he really, really just wants to, to, to be able to buy his own bread and cheese. Like, he, that's not what's going through his mind right here. It's not this I thinking. He says at the end of verse 47 that God will give Goliath and the Philistines over into Israel, Israel's hand. So God's doing the work, and it's actually not even through David, or for David, it's for Israel as a whole. It wasn't about one man, not even to the one who remained steadfast when everyone else fled. This story still isn't about David. That might surprise you. I mean, it's, it's not about David and his, and his, his, his awesomeness, his faithfulness even. Despite what maybe you were taught in Sunday school, it never really was about him. David was God's instrument to defeat the Philistines and to remind his people who he is, who he was and who he is. And there in verses 48 through 51, we come to the moment we have all been waiting for. David runs to face Goliath. He runs into the face of danger, not away from it. Now, I, I don't think that, 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 is, uh, that that's like a message for us to be like, all right, let's go run into a burning building. I don't think that that's a, a proper application here. This type of running into danger is more like boldly taking a stand for Christ, saying against all odds, I'm going to follow him being willing to take on the obstacles in front of us because we are not alone in the fight, being, able to, being willing to draw a line in the sand because we know whose team we are on. 
David runs in, and as he does, he grabs a stone and his sling, and he swings it, and it hits the giant squarely in the forehead, and he falls face first into the ground. Now, some people believe that this, this, this alone killed him. It's quite possible. I tend to think that, 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 that that's a little bit, um, not, I wouldn't want to say unlikely, because God is absolutely powerful enough to do that. But I think, what I think happened here is the stone hit him in the forehead, and he knocked him unconscious, and he fell face for, for, first on the ground. And the reason why I think that is because what does David do immediately after? Doesn't worry about the army behind Goliath. He doesn't wor- worry about the shield bearer. He doesn't worry about any of the people behind him, probably cheering at this moment. He runs straight to Goliath, grabs his sword, because he didn't have a weapon beyond, be, beyond the sling and stone. He grabs Goliath's sword, and he chops off his head. And he kills him. And he ends it right there and then. Oh, the irony of this great and gigantic, fearsome warrior being so humiliated and with his own sword, no less. And after all this build up to this moment, it's over in two verses. Think about what I just read the whole chapter for you, right? It builds it up and it builds it and it builds it and it builds it and it tells you all of these details, these really important details, and it's over in two, two, two verses. There's no dramatic battle of strength and wits like we would see in the movies. It's over before it even really started because God was the one who fought the battle. And often we read the story like we read stories like this in the Bible and we focus on the the insurmountable odds, right? That underdog story. <laughs> and the, the the unpredictable ending and we use it to fuel us to fight our giants. Have you ever heard that application of, of David and Goliath? And I'm not, I'm not knocking or picking on anybody, that, any, any preachers that have, have had that application. But that's really not, that's really not what the, the takeaway, that what's going on here. That's kind of missing the point, I think. David didn't win this battle because of something he said or he did, but because of who he believed in. This is where the life of David is a glimpse Catch this. This is where the life of David is a glimpse of the coming David. The David that will defeat all giants. This is a foreshadowing of Christ in this moment. When we relate to this story, we have to be very, very careful. We want to see ourselves as the underdogs, don't we? We want to see ourselves as the underdogs that, that, that under, uh, under insurmountable odds, we still, we still win. We still come out on top. There's so many great movies that, you can, that I can think of just right off the top of my head. They're usually sports movies. But anyways, there's really, really great movies, but that's what it's about. Under, under all, the, all these insurmountable odds, they win, don't they? But that's really not what's going on here. When you relate to this story, don't relate to David. Probably don't even relate to Goliath or King Saul. We relate, I think, most to the nation of Israel cowering in fear, hiding like a dog that has been scolded, afraid to step out, afraid to to rely and to trust in God and who God is and his strength. We are more apt to believe in the lie that we can defeat the giant in our own strength rather than rely on God, to think that we can manage the struggles and the uncertainties and the failures in our own strength like we somehow are invincible. Think about this story, right? None of the Israelites even stepped out. None of the Israelites even tried that we know of that's recorded here, tried to fight Goliath apart from David. None of them even thought, oh, I can do this in my own strength. Yet we do that all the time, don't we? All the time we think, I can do this in my own strength. I got, th- I got this, Goliath. I don't need God. But, but as we talk about what those giants are in our lives, let me just, let me, let me clarify that a little bit for us. Please understand me. I don't mean the lesser giants. The things that we struggle and wrestle with, the relational pains, the health, and the financial strains, those are, those are giants in our lives. Those are obstacles that we, we face, that we go through through life that are unavoidable. Sometimes we don't, we, we, I mean, a lot of times we don't enjoy them. We don't see the, the point or the fruit in them. And we, if we had a choice, we would, we would want to do it a different way, wouldn't we? That's not what I'm talking about, though. Those are, those are real issues that God absolutely cares about and wants to walk us through. But I'm talking about the ultimate giant. 
Remember I said here that, that this is a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ. This is a foreshadowing of Christ saving us from our sins. And so the ultimate giant is of sin and of death. The ultimate giant is separation from God for eternity. To that giant I speak of. To that giant we are hopelessly lost, not able to see a viable solution or a way of escape. We are trapped in our sin, until God sent his son Jesus, his own David, but much more glorious and perfect in nature. Jesus, he defeated the giant of sin and death on the cross, and when he bore God's wrath for our sin, and that's the only way to face this giant. You can't face that giant of sin and death any other way. You can't fight it alone. You can't save yourself. And by the way, when I say the ultimate giant, what that means is you got to deal with that giant before you deal with all the other giants. You need to believe that Jesus is the Lord of your life, that he died that you may have life and live for him. And like we talked about last week, believing in Jesus will reshape how you see and interpret the world. You will face those lesser giants, real but lesser giants, with a new faith and a new strength that isn't your own. All of a sudden, you are able to fight giants 10 times your size because no matter how much bigger they seem in respect to you, they're nothing compared to God. And so as we close this morning, I want to I revisit where we started. I want to go back to those characteristics that we talked about, talked about at the beginning. There was the faithfulness, the faithfulness there. We, and we see this in this story. Consider Consider for a moment the indignation that David had for, for Goliath and his insults against God. It greatly offended David that God should be mocked. Think about that. Does, does an offense against God offend us? Does, I mean, just being real, it's, I mean, it's kind of rhetorical, don't answer, but does an offense against God offend us? David shows a faithfulness here. And remember, by this type of faithfulness, we're talking about a loyalty, a devotion. David is devoted to God's honor. He's not easily distracted or sidetracked. We too, like David, should love what God loves and hate what God hates. And we see this boldness. Consider the confidence with which David, a, a young shepherd, approaches the king in verse 32 and Goliath in verse 48. He had this unwavering boldness in these intimidating moments. How can he be so grounded? How can he be so grounded and so secure in what he believes? And to that, I, I believe that David is anchored in God's identity and God's strength, not, not by fear, not by his own personal desires or will. I think of the parable of Jesus walking on water in Matthew 14. Peter comes out to join Jesus, doesn't he? And when, when does he begin to sink? When he takes his eyes off of Jesus, when he notices, that the wind, the, notices the wind and he becomes afraid. It is when we take our minds and our hearts off Jesus that we get off track and lost. That is when fear overtakes us and it starts eroding our faith in God. And we, like David, should have boldness that is confident and unwavering because of God, of our God, because of who he is, that we can rely on him because he's not, he doesn't change. We can rely on him and who he is, not, not in our own strength, in our own will, in our own power in him. When we are completely focused on God, we have no room then to be focused on our fears. That focus, that concentration allows us to walk by faith with boldness, which is exactly how God designed it. And we talked about last week, you know, you're so focused on God. Remember, choose God or literally choose anything else to worship. And if you're focusing on God, I don't care how good your peripheral vision is. You're not seeing behind you. You know, the parents say, I got eyes in the back of my head. No, they don't. No, they don't. It doesn't matter how good your peripheral vision is. You're not seeing behind you. So focus on God. Not like, kind of like trying to like eyes going in both directions. Like face God, focus on God, and let those fears wash away. As we continue to consider these characteristics, think about the awareness of the cost. Right? It talked about the, the rewards, the, what, what could happen, the, what would be provided the victor that defeated Goliath. 
And they were great in their own right, but if, if things went sideways and horribly wrong, David would be left with nothing, or worse, he'd be dead. The soldiers, the king, his own brothers, and undoubtedly Goliath all thought he was a goner for sure. Was it worth the risk? Well, it's easy for us to look at that, that now and at the other side of the story and be like, well, clearly it was worth the risk. But the fact that he was willing to even go into the fight shows us his willingness that he thought it was worth the cost, that he thought it was worth the risk, that he was aware of what it was going to cost him and it was worth it. He was aware of that cost. He sought God's will and he stayed the course. And then lastly, consider the steadfastness of David here. This was decision time. It was time to draw the line in the sand. There are, there are so many moments in this passage that we could point to uh, where, uh, that are just really, really powerful. Statements of faith, this indignation that he has. But when we come to verses 45 and 47, which I've already read a few times, David is not facing a, a theoretical or a hypothetical giant at this point. He's not talking to the soldiers or his brothers or King Saul. Goliath is right in front of him. Goliath is right there in front of him. And if he was going to back down, if he was going to waver at all, that would have been the moment to do it. But he doesn't. Instead, he gives Goliath's taunt right back to him and he tells him specifically how this is going to go down. Think about that boldness, that steadfastness, that faithfulness there in that moment. Be like, I, I hear you, Goliath, but let me tell you how this is going to work, right? And he, and he tells him specifically how this is going to go down. And then he tells Goliath and all who are listening who the real victor is going to be before the battle even begins. And, and keep in mind, it was a short battle, but it hadn't started yet. And he's telling, he's telling Goliath and everybody else that can hear him, God's the victor here. Not me, not Israel, God. And that is the line in the sand. Against all odds, facing a literal giant, and David in God's strength doesn't move, but he digs in his heels. And so, come back to that question that we started with this morning. Where are you going to draw the line in the sand? Where is your line in the sand? There are so many important decisions in life that, that are worth fighting for. Hills to die on. I think a lot of things that today, we, we find hills to die on that aren't worth dying on, quite frankly. This is one of them. Let me be clear, this is one of them. This is one of those decisions that's worth dying for. And it all hinges on what we decide, what we believe about Jesus. It doesn't change who Jesus is. It doesn't change what Jesus has done but where we come down on this issue, where we, what we decide to believe about Jesus decides everything else. The greatest line in the sand. And if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time. The line has been drawn. At what moment are you going to step up, stay the course, and say, I will follow God and God alone. I'm devoted to him and him alone. Not him and all these other things, or him plus this or his. God and God alone. Where are those opportunities for you to display this kind of character to the world? Do you look into those, those situations? Do you, first of all, do you see them as opportunities? But do you look at those things in your life and you say, I desire God's glory in my life. Not my own glory. Not anybody else's glory. Not any organization or church's glory. I, I desire God's glory above all else. And if you don't yet know Christ, there is an open invitation from Christ himself, a free gift of grace offered specifically to you, for you. The, the David to defeat all of our giants, Jesus Christ has paid the ultimate price so that you can walk in a newness of life. So that you can, that you can rely on, you can trust in a strength that is not your own to face the giants, the lesser giants in your life. But you must first confess your sins before God Almighty, be saved by the blood of Jesus, and then, then, and only then, be strengthened to fight every giant, every battle that this world throws at you. Let's pray. Father God, I pray now as we open, a, as we go to in, your, in your word, and we look at your word and the truth in your word, God, we see how faithful and good and true you are. 
And God, we, we, I pray that as we look at stories like this, we don't focus on the Davids. We don't focus on the Goliaths, but God, we focus on you. We focus on your strength. We focus on your power and your might. We focus on what you are doing and have done and are going to continue to do in our lives. God, I pray that we, as we look at these stories like this, as we continue to consider what it means to, to, to have a line in the sand, God, that the ultimate decision, the ultimate line in the sand is to decide what we believe about Jesus. And thank you that you are a, a, a God that is constant, consistent in our lives, that, that no, no matter if we choose to follow you and love you and surrender to you, or we choose to reject you, you remain the same. And you remain, you remain faithful in your love and your mercy and your grace towards us. But God, I, I pray now for, for those of us that, that do know you as, as Lord and Savior, that have drawn that line in the sand. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, 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 to be bold, help us to be faithful and steadfast, help us to know what it costs and still be worth what it costs. That whatever it costs, it's, it's nothing compared to you. That, that we're, we're willing to lose everything, as Paul says, that we may gain Christ. And if there's somebody here today, the Lord doesn't know you, that hasn't, in that respect, surrendered to you, God, I pray that you would, you would change their heart, that you would transform them from the inside out, that you would draw them to you, to you in this moment and do a mighty work on their hearts, that you would save them as only you can do. There's no other name on, under, on a heaven or earth below that, that can save us but Jesus Christ. It's by his power and his strength that we, that we cling to, that we run to, that we trust in. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for this family, God. Thank you for your time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys go ahead and...